behind the scenes making sure this webinar runs smoothly. We have Karen Austin and Mike Lisecki from Maytech at Maricopa Community College. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar if you need uh, moderators, maybe to mute if you're not speaking. Great. The views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. To help you keep track of who is speaking at different times during the presentation, the, presenti the presenter's picture and name can be seen in the upper right corner of most of the slides. So this webinar is geared towards those interested in applying for a grant from the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program, otherwise known as ATE. To orient you to the structure of today's webinar, you can see that we are in the midst of the introductions and housekeeping and as it is highlighted in blue. We will next move into advice for cooking up your ATE proposal. The webinar then has three main sections. Lori will be leading the first two sections and Rachel will lead the third section. Following each section, Connie will be giving us her perspective as an NSF program officer. We will then stop for questions. We will conclude with closing remarks, resources, reminders about coming events, and very importantly, a chance for you to give us your feedback through an online survey which will be available immediately following the presentation. So let's finish up um, with the housekeeping and do a brief orientation to our webinar system. This webinar is presented through Blackboard. And if you can please raise your hands if you've ever used Blackboard before, we can see that a few people are already familiar with the functions. But those of you who are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. Notice the hand icon here, so to raise your hand, just click the icon. Just below is the participant box. This box lists everyone. I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback. This box lists everyone who is attending this webinar, and you may see some colleagues that you know. At the bottom left is the chat box where you can type questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. You can do this at any time as I'll be keeping track of the submissions so that we can address them at the scheduled question and answer breaks that follow each section of the webinar. To ensure that everyone can follow the chat conversation, which we really encourage everyone to participate in, please be sure that the room tab is selected. This tab is located below the chat box to the far left. It's also fine to send notes to specific people outside of the room chat, which you would like to do or which you would do by selecting other tabs, but you should know that even if you send a note directly to another person, the moderator still can see everything that anyone types into the chat box. So let's practice using the room chat box now. Please type in the name of the organization you are from and how many people are viewing this webinar in the room with you. That's some pretty fast chat going on down there. I'm going to move to the next slide. We're going to look at polls. If we have a polling question, be sure you don't type the letter answer into the chat box. Instead, navigate to the icon to the right of the hand and select the letter that coincides with your answer. So let's practice a poll now. So please select the response that best describes you or your team. Remember, you don't want to put it in the chat box. You want to go up near the hand icon and you'll see an A and you're going to select then A, B, C, or D. So navigate up to that hand box and then to the right and you'll see the drop down box for the polls. It's not tabs under the chat box. Um, it's 
It's under your name, up by the participants. All right. Um, for those of you who selected none of the above, can you please use the chat box to let us know what brought you to our webinar today? All right. So we um, have created an evaluation planning checklist to accompany this presentation, which you may want to check out after the webinar. It's on our website now, and um, so is a PDF of the webinar slides. This webinar is being recorded and we'll email you the link for the recording when it's available, which commonly takes one to two days. As an aside, when you view a recording of the webinar, you will not see the chat box conversations. By the end of this webinar, it is our intent that you will know what evaluative elements should be included in a proposal and where, and understand how evaluation can be leveraged to strengthen an ATE proposal. Remember that you can type your comments or questions in the chat box at any time and we'll go over those at the question break. Now I'll turn things over to Connie who will start us off with some advice for cooking up an ATE proposal. Good afternoon. Uh, nice to see so many of you here in terms of looking at the, chat, uh, the list of participants. I have five things that I think um, would provide you with a way to approach the evaluation portion of your proposal, but also then if you um, receive an award, to be able to um, implement that evaluation plan. So the first thing I think is that you need to start your evaluation plan as soon as you consider submitting a proposal. An evaluator can help you conceptualize what you plan to do in light of the ATE program goals and the goals of your own project. The second thing is to use the resources available to you through the ATE program. You can look at the NSF ATE award information on the NSF website. Um, I encourage you to visit the ATE Central, which you'll be hearing more about. And also, I think most importantly in terms of the evaluation component of the proposal, um, use the resources at the Evaluate Center on evaluation and particularly look at the checklist that um, you have available. It will really help you to get not only a picture of what needs to be done for your evaluation plan, but also helps you to formulate it within the whole proposal. The third thing is to closely re read the ATE solicitation. Pay particular information, uh, particular um, uh, Oh, sorry, pay particular attention to the requirements for the evaluation. One of the things that we find is that a weak evaluation plan is a common concern raised by reviewers, those people who are your peers who read and review your proposal. The fourth thing is to read and review the ATE annual survey that's on the Evaluate Center website. This provides you with a way of thinking about the types of information that um, the ATE, um, ATE program is interested in uh, you providing uh, to us so that we have a sense of what's happening at your project. And we use this info and this information can be used to aggregate across all projects to get a sense of what is happening um, in terms of the program. The fifth and last thing is, is for you to get acquainted with um, two publications that are um, designed for both evaluators and people who use evaluation. The first one is the American Evaluation Association Guiding Principles for Evaluators. And that can be found on the American Evaluation Association website. The next publication you should get familiar with is the Joint Committee on Standards for Education Evaluation, the Program Evaluation Standards, a Guide for Evaluators and Evaluation Users. These two publications help you to conceptualize um, an evaluation, but it also helps you then to review any evaluation plan that you may uh, 
that may be developed by an evaluator and then also help you to continue to monitor the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Um, Rachel, we're going to um, head over to you and ask you what advice you would give to ATE proposers. Hi, everybody. Great to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to talk a little more, more generally a little less about evaluation and a little more generally about your proposal writing. So as Connie mentioned when she was talking about the RFP, it's really important to prepare for the process of writing your grant. By reading the RFP closely as well as the grant's proposal guide and also checking out Fastlane, which is how you'll be submitting your proposal eventually. If you've never used Fastlane, it's really a good idea to go through um, Fastlane carefully and understand exactly what information and data you're going to need. Um, you may have someone on your campus who can help you with this, but um, if you don't, it's, it's even more critical for you to understand what you're going to need when you, when you um, go to submit your whole proposal. The second thing I would um, talk a little bit about with you all is to really think about getting a, a, a real team together to work on the grant. Obviously, a huge part of that team is your evaluator, but there may be other people, collaborators, folks on campus, and do, do some pre-planning. You're going to want to plan for your evaluation, and you're going to want to plan for other things too, which I'll be talking about later, which include outreach and sustainability, and maybe even long-term um, archiving. So you want to look around and find maybe a mentor within the AT community and your other collaborators, and, and get your team together. The third thing I'd say is to remember that you're telling a story here. You want to be compelling in laying out the problem and make it clear that you and your team are the right people to solve that problem. It's always good to keep in mind that the panel of folks who are reviewing and reading your proposal may or may not know anything about your content area. So really be careful about your use of acronyms and jargon. And, and the fourth thing I'd say, while probably not so helpful to you at the moment, if you're going to be thinking about putting in this fall, but, but really good advice, and I've done it myself. I think anyone who's served on an NSF panel would say the same is, you know, apply to serve as a reviewer yourself. You'll learn a huge amount about um, ATE and about the, the grant proposals that, that come in, and it's, a, it's just a great way to understand the program better. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Lori, what advice do you have? Well, first I just want to thank Connie and Rachel for joining us today. Their perspective is, is much valued by us and I'm sure all our participants as well. And you're going to hear from me a lot in this webinar, so I don't want to take too much time um, in this part. But for proposal development in general, my strongest advice is just to start early and to get feedback from someone, preferably more than one person, who isn't too closely involved with what you're proposing. And do that earlier rather than later. Um, when we wrote our last proposal, I got really, really good advice from our National Visiting Committee members. But to follow it, I had to totally reorganize our proposal. Um, and it was definitely worth it, but it would have saved me a lot of time if I had sent them an earlier draft or even just an outline of what my plan was. But pretty much all the advice I have with regard to building evaluation into an ATE proposal, I have incorporated into the checklist that Kristen mentioned. And this was sent out, if you were registered as of about 9.30 last night, we did send you the link for it. It's on our website now. I wouldn't, if you don't have it, don't worry about going out and getting it. Um, it's on our website. And we're pretty much going to be following it throughout this webinar. Um, and it will look like this, and we've organized it by proposal component. So it's real, real clear what pieces of information need to go where, or at least we hope it's clear. So we're going to launch into the main part of the webinar here. Um, this is our not-so-secret uh, recipe for a successful ATE proposal. And here with the red checks, you see um, everywhere that evaluation has to go. These are the required elements of any, any NSF proposal. And then where you need to integrate evaluation is marked here with the red checks. And what we're going to do today is show you how to mix evaluation into all of these sections to strengthen your proposal and increase your chances for a favorable review. 
the first piece of your proposal is your cover sheet, and this is automatically generated as you provide answers to the questions presented in the Fastlane system. An evaluation shows up here in the form of a box you will need to check if you're going to be collecting information from or about human subjects as part of your evaluation or your research efforts. And for most of you, you'll just need to check the box um, to indicate your approval status is pending. And this is a place where rules are going to vary by institution in terms of what is subject to HSIRB approval and what you need to do for that. So just be aware at this point that this is something that's going to need your attention as you prepare your proposal. Next is the project summary. This is the one-page statement of your proposal's intellectual merit and broader impact. And these are the main NSF criteria, um, which include several sub-criteria. You may not be able to address all of them in the limitation of one page, so focus on the ones that are most relevant to you. And you should be aware that the ATE program actually has some additional criteria under intellectual merit that are specifically related to evaluation. Um, the first one is, is the evaluation plan clearly tied to project outcomes? And also, is the evaluation likely to provide useful information to the project and others? And finally, does the project provide for effective assessment of student learning? Now, the fact that the ATE program has incorporated evaluation issues into, at the level of review criteria should be a clue to you of just how important it is to your proposal. So next is your 15-page narrative. Now, this is the bulk of your proposal. It's, you have to cover a lot of ground here. Uh, the things listed here on this on the slide are the elements of the project description according to the ATE program solicitation. And the two pieces where evaluation really needs to figure prominently are the results of prior support and, of course, the evaluation plan. So we'll look at results of prior NSF support first. If the PI or a co-PI on a proposal has had prior funding from NSF, um, related to what you're proposing in the ATE proposal, you have to start the project description with a title sec with a section titled Results from Prior NSF Support. And here reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work. And this is where your evaluation from your past projects should go, the evaluation results. Now keep in mind that not all of the evaluation results are going to be considered equally important by reviewers. So you want to be selective in what you report here and give priority to reporting those higher level impacts like, for example, student outcome data is going to be more important than data about website hits or satisfaction or something like that. So now we're going to skip all the way down to the evaluation plan. And as you can see here, there's a whole lot of important things that go in between, um, from the rationale for the proposal all the way through sustainability and dissemination. But for now, we're going to focus on evaluation. First off, the program solicitation includes specific expectations for evaluation of various kinds of projects. You want to use this information to really help you focus your evaluation. There are slightly different um, expectations for the various program tracks, such as whether you're doing materials development or professional development. But we're not going to get into the nuances of those in this webinar. So you definitely, as Connie said, you definitely want to read the solicitation carefully uh, for the information that's especially pertinent to your project. So what goes in an evaluation plan? Well, the evaluation section is made up of three main elements. Um, First, information about your evaluator, then evaluate the plan itself, the details of the plan, and you want to show integration with other aspects of your proposal. Note that the evaluation section is just one to three pages of your 15-page narrative, and three would actually be uh, quite a bit of your overall proposal. They, they tend to be maybe around a page and a half. And the first thing you want to do in your evaluation section is to identify who is going to evaluate your project um, and briefly describe that person's experience and their expertise related to the work that they're going to be need, need to do for your project. We're really just talking about a paragraph. The ATE program 
states that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project or center must be requested. So a common question that proposers ask, um, and even PIs who need to find a new evaluator, is how do I find an evaluator? It's not like there's listings of them in the yellow pages. Your best resource here may be other PI's recommendations. In fact, that's what often what I'm told that's the best way to go. Um, you can ask a center PI as they tend to have more experience. Um, you can get a listing of all the ATE centers from ATE Central website um, and also atecenters.org and we'll have more information on ATE Central later in the webinar. Um, we evaluate, have a directory of people with experience evaluating STEM education projects and with community college um, contexts. The American Evaluation Association also maintains a directory, a national directory of evaluators, and both the Evaluate directory and AEA are, directories are searchable by keyword and region. And those links are included in the, the um, checklist that is available to you. And I should mention any kind of website we mentioned today will be included on that website. And if it isn't, please let us know because it should be. And finally, wherever you are, you probably aren't all that far from a university and you can find out if that uh, institution has a research center or institute that engages in evaluation work. Now keep in mind that these are just leads uh, to find individuals to work with. Just because an evaluator is in a directory or is recommended by another PI, it doesn't mean that they're the right person for your project. So you really need to determine that person's qualifications and their fit with your project for yourself. The bulk of your evaluation section of your proposal, of course, is the evaluation plan. And so we're going to dive uh, a lot deeper into this area. The plan, the evaluation plan, has four basic elements. It needs to define the focus of the evaluation, the plan for data collection, how things are going to be analyzed and interpreted, and the reporting schedule and projected uses of the evaluation findings. And I'll go through each of these elements. In terms of focusing the evaluation, the most important thing is to clearly align it with your project's activities and outcomes. It, it should be tailored to what you're doing, not just be a cookie cutter approach. We're going to talk a bit about logic models. Um, logic models are not required for ATE proposals. They are required for at least some NSF programs, however, and we find them to be really helpful both for designing projects as well as evaluation planning. A logic model is simply a graphical depiction of what you're going to do and try to achieve with your project. It's a tool to help you think through your project design and how evaluation can map onto it. There are lots of ways to do logic models and they can get very complicated and fancy and tricky and um, you know, but what it, as they try to show how these different components relate to each other. And this is an example of a very basic one. And I prefer, I think, in my opinion, simpler is better. Um, and this is for a fictional project. It's just called the Green Energy Technology Institute. And I'm just going to walk you through um, what would go into each of the components of a logic model like this one. In the activities column, you want to convey the main things you're going to do with your grant dollars. Here, uh, in this example, we have things like workshops, lectures, dissemination. I find it useful to include the outputs in the model, and these are the tangible things that are going to be generated by your activities, things you can see and count and document. In this example, we have trained faculty, modules, and a model curriculum. The next three columns are focused on outcomes. For short term to long term, outcomes. Instead of strictly thinking about outcomes temporally as it would be suggested by the short term, midterm, long term, I find it helpful to frame the outcomes in terms of the types of changes we're looking to bring about. For short term outcomes, think about what your project beneficiaries, whether it's the faculty or staff who's supposed to be affected by your project, what they should know or be able to do as a result of the work that's being supported by your project. At the level of midterm outcomes, you can show how you're meeting that need that you identified early on in your proposal's rationale. Remember, rationale is one of the, the pieces of your 15-page narrative. Why, do you, why is this project needed? 
In this example, we're going to have more students entering green energy technology careers and more employers hiring those graduates. So what are people going to do differently because of the intervention? At the highest level of impact, there should be a very clear linkage to the purposes of the ATE program. You may not be able to bring about this long-term change all on your own or within the constraints of the, the funding period, but you do want to demonstrate a logical t connection with the overall aims of the ATE program. And it's a good way to sort of reinforce your project's alignment with, and fit with ATE. As I'm sure you're aware, it's a lot of work to put together a really good proposal, and it's just a terrible shame if you either submit to the wrong program or don't clearly demonstrate how your project fits with the program you're applying to. Now, if you want to include your logic model in your proposal, which again is not required, but I, I like to see them in proposals, um, you need to keep it to a page or less. This shouldn't take up a huge part of your, of your narrative. A logic model is really a means to visualize and communicate the salient aspects of your project and how they fit together into a cohesive package. But they're really useful for evaluation planning, which is why we're talking about them today. Um, and that's probably why people often see them as falling in the evaluator's domain rather than the project designer's domain. To use a logic model to aid in focusing an evaluation, it's helpful to go through each level of the model and frame questions that will help you learn about the quality and impact of the project. And I'll give you some examples. For evaluation at the level of activities and outputs, you want to plan on being able to answer questions like who you reached, what they thought about their experience with the project, what the quality or utility of the, the project's activities or products are. And this is largely accountability type information. It's important to have this but the evaluation shouldn't stop there. For your short-term outcomes, the evaluation should determine how the project affected participants' knowledge, skills, abilities, or attitudes. Next, the evaluation can progress to answering questions about changes in practice and behavior. And your evaluation may not actually get this far down the road, especially if you're in your first cycle of funding. If you can, all the better. Here you want to look at the cumulative effects of the project's various outcomes. What was achieved that can be sustained? What was transformative about the project? It really depends on the nature of your project, but here you're pushing to demonstrate the project's contribution to those program level aims. You may not have all the resources to answer all the questions that you come up with using the logic model, so you'll probably have to prioritize what's most important to know what's going to help you improve, and what best fits the stage that your project is in. So after you articulate the focus of the evaluation, you can then go on to describe the data collection plan. And here you need to describe what information you need, how you're going to collect it, who will provide it, and when. And this information should be clearly related to your evaluation questions, your evaluation purpose. So this is an excerpt from a real proposal for an evaluation. It's not from an NSF proposal. It is real, although I did shorten it a bit to make it work for this presentation. And I'm sure you're already reading through it as I talk, so I just want to highlight some of the key words for you. The evaluation is going to use mixed methods. It will gather both qualitative and quantitative data. It's going to be both formative and summative and address the project's merit and worth. And it's going to adhere to best practices for rigorous scientifically based research. That sounds good, right? Well, it doesn't actually provide any of those key pieces of information about the what, how, who, and when of data collection that we need to know. So this is a very generic cookie cutter description of an evaluation. And it's likely what you'll get if you wait till the very last moment to engage an evaluator in developing your proposal. So in fact, this is not what you want to see in your proposal. Okay, so you've been listening to me for uh, several minutes, and I, there's actually a little bit more, quite a lot more in this sec. This is the longest section of the webinar. So I want to give, a little, give you a little brain break um, um, before I actually ask you to do a little bit of work. So this is your opportunity to wake up your brain, stretch, do whatever you need to do to make sure you're alert and focused. Um, I know it can be hard to stay tuned when you're just watching a computer stream. And we have a bit more to get through for this part of the webinar. 
Um, and then we're going to have a question. We'll hear from Connie, and then we'll have a question break. So just take a minute, get a stretch, uh, get a drink of water, whatever you need to do. Okay. Now it's time for you guys to do a little bit of work. Here's a different example from a description of a data collection plan. It's also in narrative form. So think back to those four questions that we need to address in a data collection plan. What information do we need? How will we collect it? From whom and when? So I want to give you a minute to read through this proposal, I mean this example, and then I'll ask you to use the chat box to answer some questions. Okay, that wasn't even a minute, but I think that was probably enough time to read this short paragraph. So my first question is, what type of information is going to be collected for this evaluation? What, is, what are the types of data that will be used in this study? Just type, read, scan through it and type your responses in the chat box. Okay, we're seeing a lot of a lot of different kinds of responses uh, to those to this question. I see a lot of folks actually um, I don't need in on the methods that are going to be used, but actually the, the indicators of the type of data we're going to collect, the, the information we're going to collect, is actually the participants' feedback, evidence of application, and their, and the students' knowledge and perception. So when we kind of go through that logic model and think about what it is we need to find out, those are the things that was determined for this evaluation. Next, let's look at the actual methods. How will those data be collected? Again, use the chat box to indicate your answer. Great, you're zooming right in on the methods. Yep. So surveys and interviews are the main means of collecting the data for this evaluation. Next, next let's look at who. Who will provide the information needed for the evaluation? We could also ask who is going to collect it, but for the purposes of this exercise, let's focus on who it, who it is or what the sources of the information are. Great. A lot of people are are hitting the nail on the head. It's participants and students. A lot of people also identified who will do the collecting, and that would also be important to um, identify if there's any could be any confusion about that. But in this example, the participants, the project participants, um, and the students will provide the information. And finally, when will the data be collected?
Yep, everyone's paying attention. Um, the data are going to be collected at the end of the workshop, six months after the workshop, and at the end of the each semester. So it's pretty clear that all that information pops out pretty well. And I know it's these are just three sentences from what should be a larger description of an evaluation. So it's just a small example of how data collection, which is, again is just one component of the evaluation plan, might be described. An alternative way to present the same information, um, <clears throat> which is pretty efficient, is in a matrix like this one. Here you can see we have our project goal, and then we have the evaluation question, which is a means of focusing the evaluation. And then the indicators are the pieces of information we're going to collect. Um, in this example, we're looking at changes in course enrollments, students' intent to pursue green tech jobs, faculty opinions, the number and quality of, of employment um, interviews. So these, this is the type of information we're going to collect. And here in the methods and measure measurement column, um, that specifies how we're going to use the information, or how we're going to collect the information. And this is from where? In the data source column, and timing, of course, it tells us when we're going to get that information. Using the multiple measures, as we see here, um, that helps us strengthen our evaluation. It allows for triangulation of findings. So we, it, in this format, it's just all put in a table, and it might need some narrative support. So it's just another way of presenting a data collection plan. So here's a few tips for putting together a plan. You want to think of it in terms of building a body of evidence using multiple sources, including both quantitative and qualitative data. It's great if you can embed data collection into regular project activities. If you need students to do a survey, for example, if you could have them do that as part of a class, rather than trying to track them down later, that can be very helpful for conserving resources. You want to use existing data whenever possible, so you want to get to know your institutional research office staff if you have such an office. Um, and utilize existing data collection instruments if they match your needs, if you can find some out there. This will save you a lot of resources in developing and validating new instruments. So let's move on to the third part of the evaluation plan, which is analysis and interpretation. Here you want to address how you're going to make sense of the data, what sorts of comparisons will be made. You want to start thinking about what counts as success. Analysis and interpretation tend to get lumped together, but they really are different things. Analysis is organizing and transforming and describing data while interpretation is making sense of analyzed data so that conclusions be made about the project's quality, its progress, or its impact. Interpretation really requires some sort of comparison, whether it's with targets in terms of what you um, said you would achieve, your past performance, uh, in terms of thinking about growth over time. If you have access to national data, you could use that. Or even other sites, if you're implementing some at multiple sites, or if you know somebody who's doing something similar is willing to share their information with you. Finally, uh, in your evaluation plan, you need to touch on reporting and use of findings. Now here, you want to remember that one of the ATE-specific intellectual merit uh, criteria asks if the evaluation will provide useful information to the project and others. So you really want to be clear about how the evaluation results will inform the project as it's being implemented. This is what we call formative evaluation. It's using evaluation for improvement as the project is unfolding. With regard to reporting, you at least need to describe what types of reports will be developed and when and how the results will be shared. Keep in mind, too, that you'll need information from the evaluation for other purposes, like the annual reports to NSF, the annual survey of uh, grantees that Connie mentioned, and possibly reports to advisory groups as well, as well. This is all in addition to your project level evaluation report. And finally, throughout the evaluation section, you should refer to other relevant elements of the proposal, like the evaluator's biosketch. Um, the project budget, the data management plan, and all 
we'll have more to say on those parts of the proposal in a bit. Um, but doing this will really help show how the evaluation is an integral aspect of your project and not just an afterthought. So for this 15-page project description, I've discussed results of prior NSF support and the evaluation plan. In her presentation later in the webinar, Rachel is going to be touching on uh, sustainability and dissemination, which also will go into your project description. Um, but now let's hear from Connie, and after her remarks, we're going to have a question make break. So if you have any additional questions, you can go ahead and type in them in the chat box, and Crystal, Kristen will bring those up um, after Connie's remarks. So go ahead, Connie. Thank you, Laurie, for the presentation on um, really getting down to the nitty gritty about what goes into an evaluation plan and the evaluation section in the proposal. Uh, one of the things that I think is important that Larry, uh, that Lori stressed a lot is that you want to make sure that the evaluation plan is tailored to your project. One of the things that reviewers do is they want to see that the evaluation is closely aligned with what um, you plan to do and that the evaluation is appropriate for your project. So writing the section or presenting the evaluation plan becomes very important in terms of letting the reviewers know that um, the evaluation and the project activities are closely aligned. I think the other couple of things that I would take away from this uh, presentation is that um, the value of really understanding and reviewing the project, uh, the program solicitation to see what is required in the evaluation plan because certainly um, NSF in the uh, intellectual merit section, uh, particularly for the ATE program, it's important to have a very very clearly stated and well thought out um, evaluation strategy. Um, I think the other thing is the importance, and, and though it hasn't been stressed, I think it really behooves you to really check out your the institutional policy and procedures um, surrounding the submission of a proposal uh, to any funding agency but to NSF. Um, it provides you with an opportunity to get acquainted with people uh, across your campus. And also it will lessen headaches as you get towards um, submitting um, your proposal. And it also has to do with how one should go about um, working with an evaluation, particularly when it comes to um, mechanisms for um, um, paying for the evaluation. The last thing I think that it's really important is that to use the checklist that uh, Lori mentioned, plus reviewing the webinar and the webinar slides to really get a good sense of not only uh, what goes into the evaluation section of a proposal, but I think the checklist provides you with a way to see the evaluation in terms of the whole proposal and how the evaluation actually addresses um, many of the sections in the um, in your proposal. The other thing that I want to end with is that it really is important for you to know what the experience and expertise of your evaluator is because certainly as you develop the evaluation plan for the proposal, that becomes very important in terms of getting a, a plan that is uh, tailored to your project rather than just a very generic um, description of what the evaluation would be. So thank you, Lori, and um, look forward to a answering any questions. Thank you, Connie. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a question break right now, and we have quite a few questions. Lori, we're going to start out with a question that asks, um, should we include support from other federal agencies like the Department of Labor for our project in the prior support section of the project description? Actually, that is an NSF requirement, and it's, I, I, if I'm incorrect, Connie, I hope will correct me, but it, the, it, the requirement is results from prior NSF support. So they're really looking at what you have done in the past with NSF funds. 
Now where other grants might come into play is um, in the senior personnel bio sketches, and someone had a question about that, so I'll just follow right into that. Um, the bio sketch is a two-page sort of a vita, but it's very condensed. And one of the um, categories for a bio sketch is synergistic activities. So there you describe the activities that you or whoever the, the bio sketch is about, the per, the, what they're involved in that relates um, to what their proposal is doing. So there you might bring in work you've done under other um, funding sources. But I do not believe you would include it in, in the proposal unless it, you know, you wouldn't have to put it that way. If you want to talk about it as, you know, you've learned from experience on a, this other project and you're bringing that into that, that would be fine. But it wouldn't be required. Great. Thank you, Lori. Um, we have an, oh, go ahead, Connie. Okay, I agree with Lori, and I think that this prior result is really about NSF, but it could be that in what you are planning to do, you could describe what you've learned or if from other uh, support from other um, agencies or foundations. And that could go in your project description as you describe um, what you plan to do and what um, your project is based on because it could be a continuation or building upon um, other prior funding from um, other other um, uh, funding sources. So I think it's, it helps to provide a context for your project if you include something about prior support if you have had prior support. Great. Thank you so much, Connie. Lori, to what extent is it expected that the evaluation data will be made available to researchers and other people outside of the project? Well, that's a good question, and that really comes into play in your data management plan, and Rachel's going to be speaking on that. Um, there's no hard and fast rules here. What you need to do is, um, in the data management plan is be clear about what data will be generated and of that what can and will be shared and how. Now that's all constrained by obviously things like privacy. Um, you're not going to release private information about individuals. But there, the NSF started this data management plan. If you look through the requirements there, it's clearly, it seems to me, motivated by an interest in having information shared more broadly, what people are learning from their NSF funded projects. And so that shouldn't be locked away and the and only, you know, of use of those the person that was funded, but shared more broadly to advance uh, you know, the advanced science and learning. Um, so it's there's no easy answer there, but you need to think it through and be clear about it in the data management plan and provide a rationale for whatever decisions are made around that. Okay, great. Thank you, Lori. And we have another question. When working with an evaluator on the front end, is this a service you pay for? And if so, how much is it to have this aid in creating an evaluation plan? This person is unfamiliar with projects that require bringing on an evaluator pre-submission. Yes, and again, this is another tricky area. Um, it's sort of a catch-22. Like you need to get an evaluator in on your project. You want them named. You want a budget and you want a commitment letter, and you want the bio sketch, but oh, we can't pay you for any of that yet, right? Or we work, I mean, our unit our evaluates located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University, and we, um, we kind of deal with this uh, all the time and, and in different ways. Typically, and this is in no way speaks for all evaluators, I'm speaking from my own experience, we will get a call from somebody who's working on a proposal, and they would like us to um, collaborate with them. And so they'll send us their materials. I mean, if we agree and we think it's viable and worth our time, they'll send us their materials, typically in draft form, hopefully far enough in advance for us to do a good job, and we'll work with them to develop that, you know, one to one or two um, page evaluation plan and, and give them the other additional information they're going to need about the evaluation for the proposal. And we'll do that with the understanding that if they're funded, they will select us as their evaluator. Now, I realize some institutions don't allow that, that everything has to go out for bid um, and until you can't get that person on board until you have the funds to pay them. I don't, I, maybe Connie can comment on that because I know that 
it's it's challenging. I I just know from like from what people have said and from direct experience, both as a reviewer and a proposer, that reviewers really want to see the evaluator identified. So if you have to work with you know your uh, your in, your ed, wherever you're located, your college to figure out how to do that. I mean, I think that it, there's no one answer. You have to work with in the the policies of your institution. It may be that you have a small amount of funds that you could bring on somebody at the proposal development stage and actually pay them. Um, at an evaluator, I'm sure anyone would would appreciate that. And there and there are certainly limits to what an evaluator was willing to do for free up front. You know, sometimes a proposal could really use a lot of work and could use an evaluator's eye on it, but are they going to set aside, a, you know, five days to help you develop your proposal just because you might get funding and, and they might get the contract? Um, maybe not. So you need to be reasonable about the, about the expectations there. Um, so I agree I with Lori. Go ahead, Connie, sorry. So I agree with Lori in terms of um, the challenges of putting together an evaluation plan um, as you're writing your proposal, particularly if your institution has policies um, that you need uh, to follow. But I think the, ch the one way to address that is instead of being surprised, you get it. You you really do make some contact with folks at your institution to let you know what their policies and procedures are and begin a dialogue on um, how one should be going about this if the, particularly in the ATE um, proposal process, um, that it is very valuable to have an evaluation person named. Thank you, Connie. Um, I have a question here that I think would be great for you to field. With PIs who've had many, many NSF grants, can and should we limit prior support in proposals to most recent or most, most closely related to this kind of activity? So in the prior support, uh, the, the important thing is first to report um, outcomes from projects that are closely related to um, the proposal that you are um, submitting. Um, because that's how people are going to be able, the reviewers are going to be able to see that um, that this support really is related to what you are doing. Now, if, it, if, if you have um, other awards that aren't quite related to the project, but it's important to report. I would report those. But I think the first thing um, I would do, and this is my own opinion, is to say, to write about prior support from those projects that are closely related to the proposal that you are um, going to be submitting. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions, but I think I'll hold them for our next question break. Um, so let's go ahead and pass it back off to Lori to bring in to bring us into our next section. Thanks for those great questions. A lot of them are difficult, and it is a complex area. So you know, keep them coming. So the 15-page project description is the biggest chunk of your proposal, and it's the most complex piece of a proposal package in many ways. Um, but there are a few other elements that require information related to the evaluation. So I'll go through those now. And this is a pretty short section, so if you have more questions, in addition, you know, go ahead and type them in, and we'll address those in addition to any that we didn't get to already. So evaluation should be evidenced in your references, and this also is a required section of your proposal. It helps demonstrate the evaluator's knowledge and competence. It can also help show how the evaluation is really grounded in and building on current knowledge and practice. If you're going to apply a specific evaluation approach or instrument for the evaluation of your project, you know this is where you would provide citations to, to support its use in your context. So if you have an evaluator you're working with, you want to ask them to embed those appropriate references in the plan and then provide you with the full bibliographic citation so you could include it here. Someone had asked about biosketches. 
Um, the evaluator's biosketch should reflect his or her past experience in conducting project evaluations. So you, you want to get one for your evaluator. You want to use this two-page NSF format. And I think we have a link to a, a something related to this in our checklist. It's two pages, and it has certain categories you have to go through. Um, What's tricky here is there is a section in Fastlane for biographical sketches, but this is only for senior personnel, the PI and the co-PIs. So you would actually include your evaluator's biosketch with the other supplementary documents um, just because of the way the Fastlane is set up. So one of the other sections, which doesn't show on this, I had mentioned earlier, is synergistic activities. So you know this is a place where you could talk about the other types of evaluation um, projects your evaluator has worked on related to what your the project that you're proposing. So you may recall, we're getting down to budget now, you may recall this quote from the beginning of the webinar. Now the rest of the statement is that the requested funds must match the scope of a proposed evaluative activity. So this isn't real specific. So we'll, we're, now we're going to do a poll. We learned how to do a poll earlier. So the question is, on average, what percentage of ATE budgets do you think is spent on evaluation? So use your poll buttons at the top right under your name to register your answer. Okay, Karen, you want to go ahead and show us the results? So we don't have our bar graph up, but I can see a lot of people, but not everybody are, yeah, there we go, picking, 39% picked D, which is in fact the right answer. In fact, the rule of thumb is 10%. But the reality in ATE is that about 8% of, um, of grantees' budgets goes to evaluation. So this can serve as sort of a benchmark for you when you're developing your budgets and, and thinking about how much you need to devote to evaluation. So what goes into the budget for evaluation? Now as I go through this, I just keep in mind that this is actually going to boil down probably to one line in your overall project budget. But I just want to give people a sense of what goes into it. The, what an evaluation costs. Of course, the key elements are time, any travel required by the evaluator, any materials they need to do the job, and any if they have any institutional indirect or overhead costs. We can't, our university, we call this FNA facilities and administration costs. I'll review each of these. With regard to time, the key question is how many days does the evaluator need to spend in order to generate the needed evaluation deliverables and services. The evaluator should be able to give you an estimate of the number of days required for the main evaluation task. This should not be the first question you ask them, however. You need to figure out what your needs are, what information you need, um, and then they'll figure out how many days they need to spend to do that. Travel is getting expensive, so you want to make sure it's included in your evaluator's budget if any is going to be required. Um, it can really eat up a small budget, so you want to make sure you're realistic about these costs. You know, is the evaluator going to need to travel to attend the annual PI conference, maybe some advisory committee meetings, or any special project events? Do you want them to travel to a different site to collect data from participants or to meet with project staff? Things like that. Materials and other expenses category are just, it's going to be things like maybe paper, copy costs, postage. This typically is not a very large category for an evaluation budget. Finally, there may be a separate indirect or overhead cost included in the evaluation. And the rules and policies around this issue are going to vary by institution. Here at WMU, our institutional indirect rate is 50%, which is actually just slightly lower than average for research universities. And the rates and policies are going to vary. So again, this is a, something you, just to be aware of as a possible expense for the evaluation. You'll need to prepare a budget justification um, for your overall project budget. And here, um, you can explain the evaluation costs 
specifically, including the evaluator's daily rate, um, the time they have committed to the project, uh, any travel required materials, institutional and directs, those categories that we went through. Um, I had a situation once where I submitted um, uh, just a single amount for the evaluation, and before we were funded, we needed to give the daily rate for the evaluator. So just save yourself some hassle down the road and include that up front. And finally, the last part of your proposal is your supplementary documents. Um, here you want to include a commitment letter from your evaluator that shows both that person's individual and organizational commitment to work on the project. I know here at WMU we cannot write a personal letter saying, yeah, we'll be work on your project. Um, it has to be approved by our um, Office of Research that has, so to show our institution's commitment as well. It's also where, in the supplementary documents, it's also where you'll put that bio sketch that we talked about for your evaluator. And you must include a data management plan. The data collected as part of the evaluation should be addressed in the plan. And Rachel's going to say more about that in her section, so I'm not going to say too much now. But that brings us to the, the end of this short section um, and, the, and the end of our list of ingredients for an ATE proposal. So I'm going to hand it back over to Connie now. Um, to see if she has any remarks on these sort of the more uh, technical pieces of the or administrative pieces of the proposal. Thank you, Lori. So I think one of the things that Lori mentioned that is really important is how you describe um, your uh, the consult the the evaluator in your budget justification. And I think the clearest place that it's stated in terms of what is required for the proposal is in the grant proposal guide. And you need to make sure that the one that you look at is the one that is currently in place because this guide is revised as um, things change in the federal government. Um, the other thing I think she mentioned that's important is the whole notion that you want to demonstrate that your evaluation is informed um, by the literature. And uh, the best way to do that is um, through the references. So we don't so I think the strategy is to show or to demonstrate to the reviewers that the evaluation plan is sound and that it draws on current literature rather than telling them that it does. So I think those two things, demonstrating um, the quality of the evaluation through referencing and in the bio sketches, and being very clear about what is needed in the budget justification um, in terms of evaluation are, are two good takeaway um, messages from Lori's presentation. Thank you, Connie. Um, we're going to move into questions again, so feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Connie, can we start out with a question that we saved from the last section, but I think it's appropriate here as well. How does including the evaluator in the proposal mesh with the competitive bidding requirements of NSF rules? And I think dovetailing with that is maybe what should a proposer do if their college requires them to put the evaluation out for bid so they can't identify them in the proposal? If you might be able to address those two issues. So one of the things, um, the kind of perspective or approach that NSF takes is that the um, institution's policies and procedures are ones that um, must be followed. And so, so if your institution requires that you go out and have a bid, and you can't go out for a bid um, before you have an award. I think mentioning it in, your, um, in the evaluation section, but having enough description of what the evaluation would look like would be helpful. Um, I think that would be the most important thing to do. Is really, and, and again, work with your institution on um, uh, how this can be accomplished, and perhaps even having a letter from your institution that you could put in the supplementary documentation that you reference in the um, evaluation section would be helpful. One of the things about this supplementary um, 
materials section is that um, aside from the the data management plan which is required, um, reviewers are not required to look at supplementary materials, but it's helpful to at least reference those in um, in your evaluation plan and in your uh, proposal. And what was the other question? Um, the other question is, what should a proposer do if their college requires them to put the evaluation out for bid so they can't identify them in their proposal? I think the thing is 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 that you need to make sure in your evaluation plan you should describe that this is the policy for for your particular institution so that it's very clear up front that for your particular institution naming an evaluator um, prior to award would not is not possible based on the institution's policies and procedures. The second thing to do is to document that, and that would be to get a letter from your institution stating that that is the case. And then I would, and this is my opinion, I would list the types of questions that you would be interested in in terms of what you would like the evaluation to actually address. Um, again, looking at going back and looking at the checklist, looking at um, the um, the slides in the presentation that help you think about well, what do I really want to know about my particular project? There is no good workaround um, in terms of if an institution is um, requiring a PI to do particular things that don't necessarily match well with what the requirements are for the ATE um, proposal. Okay, thank you, Connie. Um, Lori, how does a college with no prior NSF support respond to their prior support question? Uh, I think you just can need to say it's not relevant, or you know, it's not like you have to make anything up. Just say it's not relevant or no prior support <laughs> to report. Great, and we're and having I think a little Connie bit of a discussion. Sorry, Lori. No, go ahead. Uh, it, proceed. I was just going to say, um, we're having a bit of a discussion in the chat that um, can you note exactly what direct costs are at Western Michigan University? Well, I, the, I, when I say indirect, that are it's facilities and administration. And it's calculated in a very complex process that I don't even know what it is. It's like what percentage of our of our facilities and administrative costs or support research and that's how it's calculated and it's a it's a federal it's a there's like a formal agreement with the federal government and it sets it at fifty percent. So if we have a project that's a hundred thousand um, dollars, the project would go, we would add on fifty percent of that that goes into indirects, which is which goes to the university to support um, you know, research facilities, light secretarial support and so forth. Which is different than um, fringe benefits, which is calculated based on uh, compensation. It's going to be different at every exact, institution. Right. Thank you, Lori. And what is exactly in direct costs at Western? Well, that's going to be your. I, I'm not going to try to go through that. I mean, that's going to be. There's a specific NSF format for budgets, which you'll, you know, it's the senior personnel, fringe benefits, travel, consultants. It's all that. I don't have it memorized, but when people go in to do their budgets in Fastlane, they'll see what those direct cost categories are. Great. Um, we have a few more questions, but I think again we'll hold them off to make sure we have enough time for Rachel's presentation. So, um, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Rachel, and feel free to continue to type your questions in the chat box and we'll catch them all at the end as we can. And Rachel. Hi everybody. Good to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the areas that uh, Lori highlighted and, and didn't cover quite as much um, in her discussions of evaluation. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, AT Central, which is the project that I'm the PI of. And AT Central is um, acts as an information hub for the AT community. 
Um, we work to support and promote the work of ATE through a variety of, of services, publications, and tools, and, and we can offer some support for those of you writing proposals. We have um, an information portal, i.e. our website, and um, we collect a lot of information and organize it and disseminate it about projects and centers themselves, about the resources used and created by the projects and centers, and by the various events that ATE projects and centers sponsor or host. Here are some of the things that we can give you a little bit of support um, with, and you can find a lot of information about this these various areas on our website, and I'm going to go through some of these areas with you briefly during this webinar. You're always welcome to follow up with questions um, and during the webinar, during our question and answer um, period, but you can also email us at AT Central if you have other questions we can be helpful with. So um, one of the things that we can help with is developing um, online resource collections for those of you who might be doing um, a larger project or center and you're bringing together lots of information that you'd like to, to um, present online, we can help you with that. We can also help you with thinking about archiving the resources that, that you may create eventually. Um, and that could be part of your data management plan. Um, we can also provide some support in creating outreach and sustainability plans and carrying those plans out. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, as Lori mentioned, about data management planning, and then also um, we have a couple tools that can help you find collaborators and partners. All right, here's my trusty librarian. I am a librarian, so I'm, I'm allowed to put this lovely lady up and, and mock myself just a little bit. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with creating uh, digital collections online, we can help you think about how to plan to create that digital collection, things like schemas and metadata and, and harvesting those collections, um, the cataloging workflow that goes into maintaining that collection, and, and then thinking about the long-term maintenance and archiving. We also have some software called CWIS, um, Collection Workflow Integration System, which was funded with National Science Foundation um, funding, and it's free open source software that we've created that can help you put up your own sort of digital library or um, data collection repository. All right, let's move along to outreach. So as Lori mentioned, outreach or dissemination, depending on what you want to call it, um, is one of those areas that you need to put in your proposal, you need to address in your proposal. And we created, to help the ATE community specifically, we created something called the ATE Outreach Kit. This is done in conjunction with WGBH, um, which is a public television station in Boston who has a wonderful marketing team. And the kit is divided into some sections. It helps you with outreach planning. It looks at best, best uses of social media. Uh, it gives you some guidelines for best communication practices, as, as well as a whole list of outreach resources. And you know, this is an area for, for, for even the smallest project all the way up to a large center. Um, you're going to need to think a little bit about how you want to disseminate and share the resources and data that you collect. And that's part of what you're going to be thinking about for your data management plan, but also in your dissemination plan. One of the things that I always tell folks when they start to think about outreach planning is to really focus very specifically on who your audience is. So in this case, for example, maybe one of your audiences is second year female welding students. You want to get that specific because part of what you're doing is really trying to think about how you can um, find your audience where it is at, at most of the time. So in other words, if you know that your audience reads certain blogs, looks at certain publications, um, subscribes to certain lists, you want to make sure that you're meeting them in the places that they are. So here are some good ways to start thinking about your audience. Who are your potential collaborators on your own campus? Um, what news outlets might be interested in the work that you're doing? What professional associations might be interested? So thinking about specific groups who could use and benefit, um, use and benefit from the deliverables of your project or center, and then also looking at other AT centers and projects that are um, engaged in similar work. So the core of that dissemination plan should really be focused on identifying your audience. Another good way to find partners, find dissemination um, 
channels is through looking at other folks within ATE. On the ATE Central website you'll find a map interface and you can go up and play around with that and um, you can, you can uh, modify the map so it only shows projects, it only shows centers, or it shows both. And this can allow you to find folks in your region. It can also allow you to find folks who are working in your particular content area. So if you're writing a small project in nanotechnology, you may want to identify who are the folks who have other projects in nanos and where's the center for nanotechnology. Um, these are great people to help you with planning your grant proposal potentially. They're great collaborators and they're great dissemination partners. Another thing that you can find on the ATE Central website is the social media directory. This, helps, this can help you um, track who's using social media and, and which social media um, tools they're employing. It's also a great um, directory to use for building your own social media dissemination plan. You can see here that we track not only the projects and centers themselves, but also um, NSF, other NSF projects and directorates as well as other um, ATE related organizations like the American Association of Community Colleges. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the data management plan. As, as Lori um, and Connie both mentioned, this is something that must go into um, everyone's proposal and it's, it is a maximum of two pages. It needs to be titled Data Management Plan, not surprisingly, but that's important because it's going in as a supplementary document. It's going to be mixed in with your letters of collaboration and information on your evaluator. So you really want to make sure that it's clear that this is, you know, what this is, that it's the data management plan. There is, if you read the um, uh, grant proposal guide carefully, it does say that you may include only the statement that no detailed plan is needed as long as the statement is supported by a clear justification. However, I would almost never recommend that you decide you don't need a data management plan unless you've talked to a program officer about that. So we're going to go through the areas of the data management plan um, by thinking about questions that might help you uh, as you're creating it. All right, so types of data. What types of data, metadata, or resources will the project create? So you might even want to come up with sort of a handy chart if you feel like you're going to be creating a lot of things. That's what we did in, in our data management plan for AT Central, for example. So for us, because we do a lot of cataloging, we're actually doing a lot of metadata creation. So um, metadata is data about other data. It's the information that describes the data. And so for us, for example, in AT Central, the metadata um, is one of the data types that we are going to be uh, creating. And that describes, for example, educational resources in the AT community, and it also describes projects and centers. So we have a lot of metadata that we, that we actually create. Um, it might also be, uh, you know, curriculum, Word documents, professional development materials. And there could be a lot of data that you're, um, that you're gathering as a result of evaluation. So you want to describe each type of data. Thinking about the formats that you're using, create it, share it, and store that data. So that could be, um, you know, if there's a specific format you're using, for example, AT Central uses um, Dublin Core is the metadata standard that we use. You want to share information about um, anything that you're using to create, share, and store. Where will it be stored? For us, we talk about the fact that it's literally just being stored on our servers um, at Internet Scout, which is our, our home at the University of Wisconsin. How will you deal with any privacy or other sensitive data issues? So you may need to do some normalizing, or if you're going to be sharing sensitive data, you need to to think about how you're going to be doing that, how you're going to protect the rights of those folks whose data you've collected. Are you going to place any restrictions on how people can reuse or redistribute the project's data? 
And then how will this data continue to live after the project funding expires? And as, as Lori mentioned, you know, part of the reason that NSF is requiring data management plans is that it's very important for all this valuable data and material that's created th through the, the granting process through these wonderful projects and centers that it, it has a long life after, um, after the, the funding sunsets. So it's important to think about how you're going to store that, and, and that's one of the things AT Central can help with is that we do archive for the ATE community. Which leads me into our next area, which is sustainability and archiving. So sustainability is always sort of a tricky area of the proposal for folks. This is something that you're just writing your grant. It's hard to think about how you're going to sustain all the work, but it's something that's really, really important to do. And one of the things that I would say when you're going to write this section is to think about what you'd want to sustain long term. So you need to start by looking at the deliverables that you're creating. So, you know, are you creating curriculum? Are you doing professional development activities? What's the meat of the deliverables that you're creating? And then what's going to be appropriate to continue on afterwards? You want to involve your partners, whether that's industry or your institution or funders, and you want to look at the real costs of, of sustaining those things over time. It may be, for example, if you're a smaller project and you're creating a piece of curriculum that embedding it in your institution, knowing that it's going to continue to be taught at your institution, is in fact sustaining it. And that may be a great sustainability plan, having a letter from your, your dean or your chair saying that you know, once this curriculum is created, our goal is to embed it within the institution, and then that's being sustained. But for a larger center or project, there may be a lot of things that, that are being funded by the grant that once the grant funding dries up, it may be harder to sustain. So you may need to look to industry partners or to continued funding. But you want to think about some areas. You want to think about sustaining technologies, the activities of the grant, specific materials, maybe data, and of course staff. Lots of good information can be found on, on the areas that I talk about in the ATE Central Handbook. This is um, a PDF that we have online at the ATE Central site. And um, you can download it. It has information sort of ATE 101 for those of you who are newer to ATE. It talks about how to do outreach planning, uh, lots of information about creating um, digital collections if you're interested in that, as well as um, the data management plan. And in it you'll find an example of ATE Central's own data management plan that you can look at as well as some other great resources on how to do data management planning. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen for questions and comments. Thank you, Rachel. If you have questions um, for Rachel, please uh, type them into the chat box now. Um, Rachel, you talked about using the ATE Central map to find partners. How would you advise a proposer to start the conversation with a potential partner when they don't even know them? You know, I, I think there are a variety of ways you can do that. I, I tend to be pretty comfortable with cold calling, but I know it's not for everyone. So I mean, I think what's nice about the map is that you can, as I said, you can go in and look for folks who are in your region or who are, um, who are uh, doing a project or center that's in your area of um, expertise. And you can just drop them an email, talk to them about the fact that you're um, writing a proposal, and figure out what you really want to get from them. Are you looking for somebody to give you specific kinds of advice? Are you looking for someone to generally ask about the proposal writing experience? And just let them know that it's an, a really, really friendly community. I think Lori and anyone else who's been a part of the community, Mike, would agree that people are very open for the most part to, to helping folks who are new to the process, and it's a very welcoming community. It is. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to go back to Connie. Connie, do you have any advice as to whether evaluators should be written in as consultants or subawards? I think this is something that needs to be negotiated with your um, the evaluator in terms of how they do business, but also it needs to take into account how your institution would like you to do business. Um, so there is no hard and fast rule. Um, at NSF or even for the ATE program of which which way is better. I think it depends on um, the institution from which the proposal is coming from and also the way that the um, 
the evaluator would prefer to work. Okay, thank you, Connie. Lori, can you tell us where does the work plan for a sub award award go, and can the budget for a sub awardee go in the budget sub of justification? Uh, Kristen, I would refer that person to the grant proposal guide and Fastlane. All that information is going to be really a much better response than I think either Connie and I could provide from memory. Okay, great. Um, we do have a question about uh, what letters of support, where would those go? Yes, commitment letters, letters of support, um, those go in the supplementary document section. So get one for the evaluator and anybody else you said is going to work with you as a partner. You need to show that they really have agreed to do that. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Laura, I have one more question for you. What documents, um, what other documents that are re related to evaluation would be included in the supplement of supplemental documents? Well, again, you want to keep in mind that reviewers don't have to look at that, and the review is a very uh, it's a very time consuming job. So I wouldn't dump too much there. That's not critical. But if you had more detail about the evaluation plan that you wanted to include, um, I think commitment letters really is the key thing. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else. I think Kristen, we should probably move ahead. Uh, we have like one minute left. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for. Um, the wonderful presentations and answering all these questions for us. Our next webinar is on September 18th and it's ATE Evaluation 101, which provides an orientation to evaluation for new ATP, ATE PIs. Rachel will again be joining us and um, we will also have Elaine Kraft with us. And um, they're going to have great advice for getting people at your institution on board with projects with your project and setting up a good work relationship with the data person there. If you're already funded by ATE, we invite you to participate in our evaluation workshop at the upcoming ATE PI conference on October 23rd. At the conference, we'll present a workshop that takes an in-depth look into the strategies, into strategies for meaningful interpretation of ATE evaluation data. And um, we would like you to also visit our website. We've had a lot of questions in chat about going there for um, different uh, products from this webinar, but you can download quarterly newsletters, access information from our past webinars, see the slides from this webinar, learn more about our events, and um, also use our resource library and the evaluator directory. So we're going to now turn it over to the um, evaluation survey. It may come as no surprise to you that evaluation is pretty important to us here at Evaluate. We'd like your feedback on this webinar as well as your ideas about topics that you'd like us to address in future webinars. So a, a survey should now be up on your screen. It will just take a minute or two to complete. And um, we'll leave the survey open. Moderators, remember, do not close the survey window on your screen. And while you're working on the survey, we'd like to thank you for your participation in today's webinar. And Connie, Rachel, Lori, thank you again for sharing your wisdom with us today. To all of you, good luck with your proposals and have a really great day.